All righty, let's get the party started. We are gonna make a blank project and keep everything as it is. Blueprint and we can lower the quality, but nothing else matters. The version of engine doesn't matter at all. Let's create the project. Unreal will automatically give us this huge open world and that does not quite suit our 2D needs. So let's make a new level. Click on file, new level. And we're gonna make completely empty level. Let's create it. And now by pressing Ctrl S, it's gonna save our new map. Let's call it main level. You can also set it up that the next time the project opens, it will automatically open our new level. Uh, let's go into edit, project setting, and under maps and modes, we can select our main level. Now we can open our content drawer right here or with a shortcut control spacebar. I would definitely recommend right from the start get used to shortcuts. And in the content browser or content drawer in here we can store all our important assets. So let's dock this in the layout so we have it accessible all the time. And first thing we will do is to clean this up a little bit. Let's make it some folder structure. We are gonna make it a folder that will be called core and all our blueprint script will be hidden there. So let's save this and we're gonna make it another one. Now if we open that let's start by making our character. Let's right click here, select a blueprint, blueprint character and we can call it our player pawn. Now if we open our player pawn we will see a bunch of components that belong to this blueprint. All these are inherited from a character class, that means when we sell, when we created this blueprint as character, all these are automatically set up for us. We don't actually need all of them, but it's gonna help us with setting up movement. With our character movement right here, that means all our gravity and our input by the controller is automatically set up for us. So, what we will of course need to add here is our camera. So let's click here on add and put here a camera. And we cannot quite have camera by itself, we also need something that camera is attached to, because we want to set up a certain distance from our camera. And for that we need spring arm component. So again, let's click on this add, select here a spring arm. And we wanna make sure that it's not like this, we want to our camera being attached to the spring arm, not the other way around. Now when we select our spring arm, we can rotate the camera, make sure to realize I am using shortcuts, that means W for location, E for rotation. Roll it in here, and on the right side here we have target arm length, how long should our distance from our camera be. Let's try about 1000 by default, and there is a few things we will need to change. So we want to make a 2D game, that means our, perspec our perspective should not be perspective, but orthographic view. So let's switch it from perspective after clicking on the camera into a orthographic. And let's say orthographic width we can set by default to about 2048, somewhere around here should be nice. You can always hover over the category and will explain you what exactly it is. In this case this will basically adjust us how zoomed in we are with this 2D camera. Compile it and if we minimize this we can grab our player pawn and put it inside here. And now we got this little preview of how our camera looks like. And as we can see, our camera doesn't see quite anything. So what we will need to add here is some sort of a representation of the character. So let's open here our player pawn and we can add here some sort of a sphere. But we of course don't want it to be attached to the camera, we want to be attached to the capsule. And let's reset our location and our rotation. Now if we look at it again, we can see something is highlighted there. So we do have our character here, but we still have pretty hard time seeing it. And that's because we don't have any material and we don't have any lights in the scene. That's fine though, we don't want any lights here. We just want to make sure that the materials we are using are set to unlit. That means they don't expect to be to shine the light on to preview anything. So for that, let's minimize this. We are gonna go back into content, right click here, create new folder. And this shall be art. After we create it, we can create it a new folder and this will be for materials. Let's open that and we're gonna start by making here some master materials, which most of our materials will be derived from. Let's right click here, create material and let's call it simple color material. There we go. If we open that, bunch of scary things are gonna pop out on us, but we don't actually care about most of them. And just close this. And first of all, we will change this material so it works even when we don't have any lights in the scene. Because for our simple 2D game, we don't really need any lighting system. So let's look here on the left and switch lit into a unlit. Now we can see that our material is starting to shine out. So if we go back in our player map pawn, we can apply our simple color material in it. We compile, go back in our character, our material starts having, our, not, our, not our material, but our pawn starts having some color. So we play game now, uh, our character just fell, because we are not actually quite controlling him yet. That's just a, some character blueprint that exists here, not really a character that we control. So to fix that, we can click on our player pawn inside the level, we have just one object here, 
and in the search here in the details we can find auto possess auto possess player and we are gonna set it from disabled into our player one that means player one which is just one player here is gonna automatically start controlling this character so if we click on play now we can see our character is in the center of the screen and it's actually currently falling down even though we can see that because we don't have any reference point but it is doing that okay we can save this and we can do here one little trick just to make it look nicer so we're gonna make here and uh, we're gonna make here another constant just by control c control v and we would like to convert it into parameters so this is gonna be our color one and of course another and of course the second one will be color two now i don't want just single color on this character i would like to wrap it linear interpolate that means our function will set a output color between color one and color two based on our alpha so if we set this to red and the first one will be set to pink it's gonna find us some color in between which is gonna be somewhere around here probably there we go but we of course don't want to use alpha just as a simple number we will use a freshnel function for it so let's just right click add here freshnel and uh, you don't really need to dive too deep into it it's a math formula that's often used to fake lighting so in our case it's gonna really help with a transition between colors we can connect it in here and we can starting to see the edge of the color working a bit better for us so let's lower our exponent and now we get exactly what we want so now because we turned it into parameters we can go back in our simple color material right click on it and create material instance so now any new material we want to create for your uh, game, for your enemy, can be inherited from this material. And the only thing you will need to change are the colors. So let's create material instance and we can call it material instance or so mi underscore player. Now if you open that, the only thing we need to adjust are our colors. So let's just select it and set here something a bit more nicer to look at. I'm gonna go with something like this. Let's save this. And if we go back in our character, we can simply click on our sphere and apply here the new MI player. There we go. If we play the game now, we get some pretty nice looking sphere. We will need to stay here for a bit longer because we will need another material. And that will be material for our background. If we don't really have uh, any context except the black screen here, we can't quite see what we are coding. So we're gonna have to fix that first. So let's right click on this and duplicate it. We will have here a little bit different setup, so we need to create a new material for it. Let's call it background color material. All right, we can open this. And instead of lerping with our fresh now, we can close this. And let's do here some simple gradient transition. So we can right click here and get here a texture coordinates. So by default, texture coordinates are used with our textures, basically getting us our one on one screen when we are making UV. But uh, here we don't really need to mess with it that much. We just need to mask it. And depending on how we mask it, we can preview it right in here. We are gonna get different transitions. So right now we're getting transition from left to right. And by changing which part we are masking, we are gonna choose which transition we get. If we do right, we get left to right. If we do green, we get up and down. Blue and alpha wouldn't really do much because we are having here only two vector coordinates. All right, let's change this to something a little bit easier to look at. We can do some green, let's say dark green into a lighter green. Something like that seems pretty promising. Now we can apply this. And of course you can make here a material instance, apply it, change it as you wish. But here we are going to keep it simple save this and we can start actually getting back to coding let's open our color and we're gonna right click here and create here a another blueprint and this time we're gonna make a simple actor let's call it just background and if we open that we're gonna need to do here a few things so i would like to add here some sort of a cube that's gonna be our higher part and then background so let's start with the background after adding our cube so we are technically not starting with it let's add here a plane and we don't want either of those to be attached to each other. So let's just grab here the plane and we will want to be a plane to be much, much bigger. So let's first of all, set up our material for it. So let's put it in here and set up our background color mat. And we can see our transition really nicely. So let's put it in here, rotate. Remember our shortcut, so W for movement, E for rotation and R for scale. Now we can just upscale it. Let's lock the lock here. And let's do maybe about 50 times 50. That seems reasonable because we are using simple material. We can upscale it without being worried about any issue, even if it's asymmetrically. And now if we grab our sphere, let's maybe name them correctly. By pressing F2, you can just quickly enter the naming mode. 
this is gonna be our ground and let's put the ground in here we can upscale it a little bit like this and scale it up we're gonna look for something like this let's move it a little bit lower so maybe about minus 500 and now let's maybe adjust our scale so we get the proper transition here there we go now we can duplicate our ground so right click duplicate and it's gonna be our sky and we can put it all the way on top i'm not gonna put on them any material right now uh, because they are gonna be automatically rendered uh, black but you can of course add there whatever you wish right let's close this save it all and let's find our player pawn and behind him we are gonna add this background let's move it all behind him gonna do here something like this let's put it on about approximately the same location we can actually set them exactly to the same location uh, by simply right clicking on the location here saving it getting on our player pawn and pasting in here so now they are on exactly the same location at least their center is on the exactly same location now if we click on play we can see that our character is falling to the ground now we get some reference points so what we will probably want to do is to let him jump so i'm gonna shortcut this a little bit and add that right uh, go back into my player pawn and outside of the viewport i'm gonna go into event graph I right click here and put here a touch that basically means whenever someone taps the screen in case of phone it's a tap with your finger in case of uh, pc it's just touch with your mouse when this happens you want to call a launch character that's a function that comes with from our character class so what we want to do is to override our z and set the z value we add to let's say about 800 all right we can compile this close this thing and uh, one more thing we need to do we just try to play right now nothing will happen except our mouse will disappear so the more uh, one more thing we need to do here is to let the engine know that we want to use our mouse for touch so let's go into edit editor preferences and in here we can find use mouse and use mouse for touch let's check this in all right let's save it play and now we introduce another issue but if we click we can see that the jumping's working pretty nice so few issues that we are solving here of course our collisions on the character are a bit too big and we got here these settings that does not quite suit our needs so let's get rid of it we can start by getting rid of the controls so let's go into edit project setting and find here a touch control i'm gonna make a separate tutorial into how in how to work with a touch control on phones with unreal so if you wanna see that you can write in the comments and subscribe like all these things that's some hidden promo there but right now we just want to get rid of it so we're gonna look at our default virtual joysticks and clear it nothing should be set here let's save it all close and we can right away solve our second issue going into viewport and if you look at the collisions around our character you can see that they are much bigger than our fake bird here yeah now i said it we are we are actually just cheating and stealing flappy bird design in case you haven't noticed well you do now while i was stupidly joking around you may have not noticed i can i am adjusting the scale of the collisions right in here in the setting capsule half height radius and capsule radius so that we can compile and if we play now we can see that the collisions are much more suitable and we don't have here any touch control in here now with all the basics set up let's get into getting here some obstacles that can kill us so back in the blueprint content core gonna right click here create blueprint class and let's call it an actor and this actor will be our obstacle and because we will have more of them let's call this one obstacle parent so obstacle underscore parent we can save it all here open this up and uh, the only thing we actually want to do here is to add here something that can block our character when it comes to components so let's put here a cube and we can keep here a default material if you want to play with it add here one of the custom materials you can get here something like this right now let's just upscale this so let's do z to about 10 and we have it locked so let's ctrl z it, unlock it and set z to about 10 and let's move it up so we are sure that our center point is on the start here there we go we can save this and if we put our obstacle here we will see that it's pretty nicely blocking it if you put it on this side ctrl c ctrl v it's gonna probably do its jobs job exactly as we wish could make it a little tiny bit bigger uh, but we are gonna adjust this uh, its scale uh, dynamically later so let's maybe not dive into it quite yet so we can just keep this saved and we're gonna do here one more thing 
we want our obstacle to be constantly moving towards the player. So how it actually will look like from a player's perspective is that he is moving forward. But uh, what is actually happening is that the player stays static, it's just falling down and up, and everything is moving towards him. Well, every all the obstacles, the background stays the same. It's much safer to do it uh, from this perspective rather than having player moving forward because you can have a bunch of potential issues with uh, too high of a speed of player and also player eventually running just outside of the map. All right, save this set. We can go into event graph and find our event kick. This is what we care about. The rest of them we can just get rid of. What our event kick does is execute some function, some action every frame of the game. If your game runs on 60 FPS, this happens 60 times per second. So what we are gonna do here first is actually grab our delta seconds and promote them to variable. This is a little bit more of a complicated way how to do it, but we are doing it so our game runs always, no matter the frame rate. If we just connected it to event tick and didn't care about delta seconds, it would create quite a little, uh, quite a bit of trouble on uh, certain systems and on systems where we have too high FPS or too low FPS. Let's keep this compiled and what we are going to do here is to make here another variable because we created this float variable that's holding some numbers. And we make here another one, we can switch from boolean into the float. And again, F2 for renaming and let's call it speed. So what we want to do now is to add actor offset, add actor world offset specifically. Uh, what this function simply does is it takes the current locations and add a little bit of location what we specify here. And because we are doing it every tick, it ends up being a pretty smooth movement. But how we do that is we are going to make that vector, that means in which of the three axes it should move. Let's make a vector in here. And we can see also that now it's quite possible that our little character is going to miss our obstacle. So I'm going to also just grab it and upscale it. That may be a bit too much. Let's say something around here that should prevent it from being upscaled. And because we are looking at it from a orthographic 2D perspective, it does not really matter. We are never going to be able to see it. Right now it's not moving towards player yet, so we can't quite ever capture and see it. So let's save it. And we know that we want to adjust the x in the minus x vector. So let's grab our speed. Speed should be multiplied our delta seconds to prevent any frame rate shenanigans. And because we know that our speed by default uh, is gonna be something positive, so let's say our speed about 20, we're gonna grab the whole value here and multiply it by minus 1 to to turn it in the opposite direction because we want to go in minus x not plus x. Let's connect it into the x here, compile it and if we click on play now we should see our obstacle moving towards us and we don't see it much so let's try to debug, press f8, zoom out and it is moving but it is moving so slowly that it's practically not moving. Let's save it, set it to speed and do 200 instead of 20. Probably gonna be quite a bit too fast but we will see. Oh, I think it may have passed actually already. <laughs> oh no, hmm, it's still pretty slow. I think I just put it very far from the player and it's gonna kill our player. No. We got the logic here mostly set up and we will do here one more thing. With this speed variable, I would like to set it every time I'm creating this obstacle because I'm gonna be able to create these obstacles in a runtime. So let's grab, uh, let's have make sure that our speed is selected, look to the right and we're gonna check instance editable. So we make this variable public and set expose on spawn. With these settings we will be able to set the variable when we, uh, when we are creating this object, this obstacle parent. Let's compile this, close it in here, save it all and now into our background. Uh, we can add here some spawning of this of this obstacle. So let's click here on add, put here a arrow because we want a reference point where should it be spawning. Move it down here let's say in about here because you want to spawn it somewhere low to the ground and let's say around here. We have it maybe our background is unnecessarily big but that's fine we can adjust it later. And now let's go into our event graph and what we will do here is to set a timer. That basically means a repeating event that's looping and happening until we stop it. So let's put here a timer, set timer and that event will be a custom event and let's call it Spawn obstacle. We want to make sure that this event is looping. Let's check it and let's start by spawning every second. I'll hide this in here. And now with our spawn obstacle, we simply want to spawn that object we created before. That means our obstacle parent. So we're gonna spawn here a actor from class. And for our spawn transform, that means where should it be spawned, we can grab our arrow. Let's grab the arrow in here and get world transform. Alright, 
connect it in here and just to be sure let's make it to always spawn ignore collisions all right let's compile this and we i did not select the class that's why we got here an error so i want to get here a obstacle parent save it and we have here our option to select the speed look at that that was right all along let's make sure we can compile this let's speed it up a bit let's do like 500 let's now save it all click on play and let's see how is that looking no obstacles nothing oh, okay there we have a lot of them and then we can see them spawning here so we can see that it's now overlapping with some other one that's because uh, the one that we created before does not have the uh, same settings so we're gonna just get rid of this one so it doesn't bother us and we got three we run here into one little problem if we just click on simulate and see it playing we'll see they are spawning all good and nice but they never disappear so they are here forever so what we'll probably want to do is to make sure that once they reach a certain threshold they are deleted let's go into background here and we're gonna add here some collision so in the viewport here add here a box collision can put it here on the top and let's just make it pretty big something along these lines and the moment our actors reach this let's scroll down here on component begin overlap and our actor reaches it for that matter any actor we can just destroy it well, let's just destroy actor we shouldn't run here into any issue but if you want to make sure which we probably should make sure we can get our actor and ask what it's what is its class so let's head get class and and if that class is the same class as our obstacle parent obstacle parent we are gonna make sure to destroy it if it's something else it shouldn't destroy it we don't really have other objects that should interact with it, but better to be sure than not. I would like to adjust the distance for my, for my camera. So let's grab my orthographic camera. Let's do 4086, is it? I don't actually remember. It's not like it matters that much, but this is a bit better. I would still say that uh, our uh, obstacles are level is probably a bit too big. Uh, but I'm gonna leave the adjusting it up to you. Let's make sure that our obstacles, now we can see it's pulling me towards it as well, but that's fine. So now let's add here a little bit of a variety in our obstacles. I would like to add here a obstacle that will be from above, not from below like we have here, like we have with our original. So right now I would like to make it something that uh, some system that will make it easy for me to adjust it. That's why I made this one originally a parent. So I'm gonna right click on it and create a chart blueprint. The child here inherited all the code from our parent. That means I can change some code, I can override it, tell it to do something else or add things on top of it, but it will still retain all the previous code. I don't have to write this code all over and if I need to change something, I can change it just in the parent and the child will automatically have it as well. So let's just keep it here and we're gonna call this our obstacle down. Then we will make another chart which will be obstacle up. So our down stays exactly as it is of course. So we're gonna grab our obstacle up, take it in here and simply instead of uh, starting right in here we're gonna move it way higher. And we can of course test it. So if we grab our obstacle up, put it in here, we can put it exactly on the location of our arrow. So we can see our arrow is somewhere approximately here. Ideally I would have a better setup for it, uh, but this is gonna do well enough and I'm gonna need to adjust it. So, so let's grab our obstacle up and let's say we set it to about 2000. That may be a bit too much and we actually may need to upscale this. So let's say our Z should be 20 and our location let's do about 1700. That seems to do a pretty nice job. We'll be able to adjust them later, but this is good enough for now. All right, let's compile this and I would like to add here another option and that's gonna be uh, the, from, uh, the obstacle from both sides. So let's again right click, create child blueprint. This is gonna be obstacle board. Let's keep it in here. Now our cube shall be duplicated and this one I'm gonna, we can keep it on thousand. Let's maybe replace this class so we can test it. Right, right click on it and replace selected actor with obstacles board and if we add here this cube one ideally this should be renamed but cut me some slack if you wanna rename it you rename it and let's try to add here some value in between this is actually pretty suitable so okay now we have three different obstacles that we can add here let's close call save it all 
we're gonna go into our background and right in here when we are spawning the class, uh, the class I would like to set the uh, which class are we gonna use. Let's make this into a variable. I can right click here, promote to variable and this is not gonna be a class this is gonna be a list of obstacles and this is gonna throw us few errors so first of all we don't have an initiator and any speed so and our i will end our list of obstacles is still a simple variable so let's start by changing it into an array we can click up here and switch it to array change variable type there we go compile it all and we want to from this list pick a random obstacle every time it's being selected Connect it in the class, right click on our spawn actor and let's refresh it. Right now we run into a bit of an issue. We cannot quite select our speed here. But what we can do is to still select it from our obstacle parent. Because remember, all the, par all the child automatically inherit, inherit the, uh, the attributes, variables and functions, all that from our parent. So if we cast to our parent, that means get access to it. Not particularly cheap way how to do it, but let's just do it for the sake of clarity. We can cast to obstacle parent and we can set here a speed. And that speed, let's keep it still simple, 400. Now we of course need to get here our list of obstacles. So let's click on our list of obstacles and add here three different uh, variables. That's gonna be our obstacle down, obstacle up and our obstacle and the last one which should be obstacle bot. You can look at them right in here and there they are. All right, let's compile now and see how it looks like. You can click on play, keep on jumping and we got definitely made it very difficult. Yeah, okay, we are gonna have to easy up how often is it spawning an obstacle. So let's look in here and our timer, let's probably more than double it. Let's say it spawns a new one every three seconds and we can increase our speed. Let's do 500, click on play. And if we play it now, we should see quite a bit more interesting stuff. All right, that's not too difficult. Now, I think that too will be a little bit more suitable for this, but uh, you adjust it however you want. Now, I would like to add here another function on our parent that will randomize the size of our obstacle. So, let's open our obstacle here, and we're gonna have here a construction script. That's basically the code that happens before this object is even created. And what I want to do here is to grab my cube and set its world scale. So set scale, world scale 3D, and we, we know most of our scale. So our X is one, our Y is gonna be 5.5, and by default we have Z on 10. So let's see, how about we randomize it? Let's make it a vector. We can keep it on one, and this is where our fun starts. So by default we have it on 10, all nice and fine, but why don't we get here a random, a random floating range, and let's say it should be between 10 and 15. But we of course don't want to randomize it all the time. So we're gonna put here a branch and put here a variable, promote it to variable. And this is gonna be boolean, which is gonna ask if it should be randomized. Let's put here B and should change scale, all right? Clean it up in here. And by default, we can keep it on true, but let's just see what it will do. Now, if we open our obstacle part of them, it's gonna be easier to see the reference point. We can see that it's automatically adjusting our scale. Let's say that for my obstacle bot, I don't actually want it to be randomized, so I'm gonna grab our should change scale and disable it. There we go, close it. And with our obstacle up, that makes sense that it keeps on randomizing it. I could of course turn into public variables how much should it randomize and change it. But I think this is gonna be good enough. All right, now it works fine, but we actually run into one issue. I see I made here a mistake with uh, checking for a class because our uh, childs are not currently of the same class, which makes it a little bit more confusing. Let's maybe simplify it now and we're gonna not check by the class. We're gonna check if this actor has a tag. Tag is just a simple string, simple piece of text that you can add onto any actor. So we're gonna actor has tag and let's ask it should be destroy. Connect it in here, let's copy it copy it and we can go in our obstacle parent and write in the details find here tax add it in here and paste it compile and again because we made it with this very smart inheritance if we find our tax here they are gonna be here automatically even in our children so if we play it now we can press f8 zoom out and our 
this drawing of the actors should work again, right? Seems like it works pretty well. So one quick thing I would like to do here is speeding up because right now it's fun, but it's kind of boring. So we wanted to definitely keep getting harder. Luckily, we already were smart from the start and set up here a speed. So what we want to do here is every time we spawn, we want to speed up a tiny bit. Let's promote our speed here into a variable. This is our current speed. Compile this, look to the left. And every time we got our current speed, we can get it here and add something to it. So we are gonna start with 500 and let's say we're gonna add about 20. Every time the obstacle is spawned, it's gonna add at about 20 of them. Let's try to be professional here and not hard coded it. And we are gonna call this edit speed and set this is our current speed. Now we can click on play and see if it does our job as we want it. We, we of course also don't want to speed it up too much because then the obstacles will start running in front of each other and that could lead to some, let's call it visual glitches. One thing we are missing here is uh, our player dying, so let's set it up. We can get our player pawn, let's open it, and we will be able to find here our event actor begin overlap. That means whenever our character overlaps anything, any component from within our character overlaps anything, this will be triggered. So let's make sure to get it. We can print here a string and that string should be dead. Now, if we try to do that just like this, it may not quite work with everything we want. So let's see, doesn't work with anything for that matter. So what we will want to do is uh, grab our obstacles and our background. Let's grab the background here and make sure that all of them are overlapping our character. There is a possibility, in case you are experienced with it, there is a possibility to set up an event hit as well, which is more physics driven. I would not quite recommend it because it doesn't work very well with obstacles. They don't necessarily hit it, so it creates a bunch of complications. Would not recommend right now. Let's keep it simple on overlap. Switch it all to overlap all then, and we got to do the same thing with our uh, obstacles. Let's grab our obstacles, parent, cube, set it to overlap all. Parent will do it for all the child, we just need to go into bot because here we added one cube and set that one as well. Set it to overlap, click on play and now if we hit it we can see that we fall through the ground but it's triggering our dead event. The same as if we hit anything here, it's just easier not to mess with a physics collision in here. Perfect. So now what I simply want to do in my player pawn, the moment this gets triggered, let me get current level name and open that level. This is just a quick way in Unreal how to restart the current level. Let's grab it in here, connect, and that should do the job. So we can click on it, play, seems to work fine. If I get hit here, it's gonna restart the game. I would like to actually adjust my camera. So a huge advantage of Spring Arm is this delay. We can zoom down here, enable our camera lock and camera and rotation lock. Adjusting this will basically let us set up how long from our movement it will take before our camera follows it. So we can adjust our camera lag, let's say about 5 and 5, that's pretty pretty low, but I'll see. We can enable our camera debug lag maker, so just you can see what is actually happening. And we can see this is not actually that much, it's, not full, it's still following it pretty fast, so I'm gonna probably lower it even more. Let's do like two and two. And this is quite a bit more towards my liking. Now our camera is not reacting as fast and we get quite a bit better game experience. Let's get back into our spring arm, disable our debug and there we go. Let's try to tune our behavior quite a bit more. So we can probably get our character to start falling down much faster. We can also move him higher just so he doesn't die right away, but we can get him to start falling much faster. I'm in the player pawn now, can open that and let's adjust our gravity scale to triple that. So now he will be truly falling much, much faster. And what we will have to do is to, we actually don't really need to adjust anything, but uh, what I would probably recommend now is to adjust our speed. So how much we are launching him? Let's do about 1500. So now you have to press it quite a bit more often. And I would recommend you playing with these two values to get the game feel just right. So now we can just play it. And together with our camera zoom, I think we got pretty nice little game in here. That should be about it. The project is available on GitHub completely for free. Do with it whatever you wish. And I would love to see what you make with that game. There's a bunch of more stuff you can do, of course. Add here more obstacles, make the obstacles move. 
I did way more animation with the character and all that. Uh, guys, would be cool if you do something with that and let me know if you do that. You can just branch the GitHub repo and upload it there. So we can all see what uh, different versions, what different games you can do with that. I am pretty much done here. So Sir Fancy out. That was exhausting. Hour 22 recording. You know how much I love you guys.